wonderful to be gathered here in this sacred place. Welcome to the worship of God here at First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. We are an open, welcoming, and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. And so that means whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we are back, and it is so wonderful to be back both here in this sacred place and worshiping in live time, both here and online. So no matter who you are, you are welcome in this household of faith. You are welcome here, no matter your ethnicity, who you love, where you grew up, how much money you have, or the color of your skin. For here, we proclaim that each person is essential and loved and valuable. This is a place of peace and grace where all God's children have a home, and we celebrate our diverse and compassionate community. Throughout this pandemic, we have continued to worship together as a family of faith, both outside and, of course, virtually, and we have stayed connected. Now the time has come for us to begin to regather as we have this morning in our beloved meeting house. And we are live streaming this ser service and it can be also uploaded later at our YouTube channel. And as promised, we are delighted and happy to wave to our live stream congregants. <laughs> and for those of you who are here in the meeting house, uh, we thank you for following our COVID protocols, including wearing masks, and keeping social distance. We invite you to sing together during our hymns and to join us in our unison prayers. And after the children's message, during our traditional time of the passing of the peace, we ask you to remain in your pews, but encourage you to acknowledge your fellow worshipers in whatever way is comfortable to you, while at the same time respecting their desires, safety, and well-being. And at the end of the service, an usher will come pew by pew to dismiss you and ask you to exit through the chancel doors at the front of the meeting house. I feel like a, I'm on an airplane now. <laughs> Go that way, that way. This morning, there is child care available, but uh, we do not have church school until August 22nd. We are eagerly waiting that day. There are green activity bags available for our children or, I guess, our adults as well. Please join us after the service outside on the Micah house uh, patio and lawn for a time of fellowship. And finally, as your pastors, we are grateful for your patience, your compassion, your grace during these difficult times. But this beloved community has continued to worship, to pray, to learn, to advocate, to serve, and to love. And it's all because of you. Let us now worship a good and gracious God. I invite all those who are able to stand and join in the call to worship. Some of us step back into the sanctuary. Joyfully, tentatively, vulnerably. We worship together in real time. We gather together. Grieving, hopeful, hesitant. We worship with distance, on screens, through masks. We wish for how it was. And yet we remember that we are not how we were. Reminding ourselves that we belong to a loving God who is with us. Now let us worship through prayer, word, and song. And as we worship through song, I invite you to join singing along to our first hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, verses 1 and 3.
the prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer, and I invite you to join me. Holy One, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey, you invite us into relationship with you and with one another. When you are among us, we know that we cannot leave unchanged. Move our focus from ourselves to you. Make our motives pure, and when they are not, grant us mercy. Help us to set aside our own agendas, to listen and follow where you would lead us. May this time of worship inspire us for the journey. In one voice, we now say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I know what you're all waiting for. You want to see the pillow. Oh, this isn't what you wanted to see? Hold on. Is this what you wanted to see? <laughs> this is Bear. You have a following. Hello, everyone. Miss Lauren and, and Mrs. Bear here. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to all of us here, and welcome to all of you out there. It's so nice to be together. As you'll know, or maybe I should say you don't know if you haven't looked ahead at the scripture that's coming up, we have some scripture that's going to be talking about, what do you think, Mrs. Bear, what is it going to be talking about? No, not donuts. I told you there's no donuts in the Bible. Yeah I, yeah, I agree. There should be donuts in the Bible, but there's not. Okay? So we're going to talk about some. Welcome. Yes, we're going to be talking about how Jesus welcomed everyone. And how you are welcome here today. And how you can go out into the world and welcome people. So welcoming isn't only about coming in. Sometimes it's about going out or being sent out by Jesus out into the world. So Mrs. Bear thought we would welcome you by sending something out to the children that are here today. So if you are a child, I'd like you to stand up and get ready to catch something. Come on, stand up. All right, I need your help. You're going to have to help me. Because I need two hands to oh, you hold this. Okay, who's ready? Come on, I need two hands. Okay, Hudson, are you ready? Get ready, Hudson. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, I wasn't ready. Ready, Hudson? Oh! Almost. You I think you have to do another one. Well, I don't know. All right, let me. Uh, he's polite. He's Good job. Out. Okay, Allie, Matthew. Oh, boy. Come on, come out here a little bit. Ready? Come on, come out into the. Thing. Watch out, you might want to duck down. Okay, ready? <laughs> oh. You need to work on your uh, distance. <laughs> That's how Jesus would. Come on, Matthew. I'm not letting you come on. I'm going to keep saying your name. Ready? Ready? Welcome! Oh, oh boy, how are you going to get your kids? Oh, here, your boys. Okay, boys, you ready? Okay, don't let it hit Grandpa. Good job. <laughs> 
So that is how we say welcome. And now you can go out into the world with your new toy and know that you can spread the good news and the love of God and Jesus Christ. All right, now you know what time it is. You know God loves you. You know I love you. And Mrs. Bear loves you. So would the children stand up? And all of you out there, would you stand up and look at your adults and say with me, may the good news of God's love be with you. And also with you. Let us pass the peace. Please take your seats. It is such a great joy to see faces in the pews, to see you in the pews. And I look forward to when we can all be back again in here. But those of you that are watching us on the video, we are so glad that you are with us too. Indeed, the good news of God's love moves us to be mindful of others in our community and the world. Today's flowers that adorn the chancel are given in loving memory of longtime member John Mannion. John's 88 wonderful years of life were celebrated in a memorial service here on Friday morning. Our prayers go out to his family, his daughter, Tracy Fortier, and grandchildren, Phil and Kristen Mitchell. Now let us center ourselves for a time of prayer. O oh, most gracious God, we rejoice in this first step toward returning to this meeting house to worship you. Those gathered here in this space are joined by love with those gathered in their homes. In all our various places, we are your church. You know how hard this period of the pandemic has been and we are grateful that we have been able to gather every Sunday in new and sometimes challenging ways. For all 480 days, your love, your strength, your guidance, and your presence never left us. We know we can count on you. Though your time is not our time and your ways are not our ways, so we lift up our concerns to you in faith, with patience, and hope. Merciful one, help us in our grief for those who have left this earthly life during these months when we could not fully celebrate their lives as we would have. Grant us comfort and assure us again of your loving welcome into your holy realm we ask that you make your presence known and bring your comfort to those who are struggling this day in body, in mind, or in spirit. Guide their doctors, their nurses, and caregivers with wisdom and compassion. We pray for all those humans, plants, and creatures, which have suffered the extreme heat that has covered much of our country and the ravages of Hurricane Elsa. And we continue to pray for those whose loved ones were killed by the collapse of their condo in Surfside, Florida, and those who have done the arduous work of rescue and recovery. We ask your blessing on all first responders. There are so many others we pray for, Lord. Accept our individual prayers now as we name them out loud or in silence in this time.
You have taught us to work for justice and peace among all people and in all creation. We pray for our nation and all nations around the world that they may do the same. Help us put away our self-serving ways and reach out with loving hands and hearts. By your grace, may we move forward in humility and love. This we pray to you, our creator, our guide, our comforter, and our God. Amen. We will soon hear two assigned lectionary readings, actually not for this Sunday, but this past Sunday. Our first scripture passage is from Psalm 48. In the reading, we will hear all about Jerusalem, also called the City of God. This is a psalm of praise for the city of Jerusalem, where it is believed that God dwelled among each person there. The psalmist is remembering an event at which foreign powers besieged Jerusalem, but by an act of God, really a storm at the sea, the foreign powers were defeated and enemies departed empty-handed. At that moment, the people of Israel acknowledged that Jerusalem's integrity and safety were dependent solely on God and not on their own righteousness or military strength, solely on God. So it was believed that God was right there in the city, protecting and guiding. And because of that, the people should always be grateful to God. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Mark. We will hear about how Jesus is rejected in his hometown synagogue, but how that doesn't hinder the mission for very long. In fact, it may have given Jesus the motivation to send his disciples on their first mission. Jesus purposely sends his disciples out, not alone, but in pairs. Jesus tells them to continue the mission in households, because you see synagogues where established religious leaders and authorities took control were not always open to new ideas that might have re represented a new view of God. Jesus prepared his disciples for a potential rejection, and he taught them, performed miracles, and showed them the way of inclusion and love. So you might say, Kate and David, how can these assigned readings enlighten our journeys of faith? Maybe, friends, they highlight the same messages that we need to hear time and time again. God is with us, and we are to give thanks to God. And we are called to journey out into the world just as Miss Lauren told us, to share God's love, peace, and joy, not alone, but with others. May these holy words comfort, inspire, and challenge us. So nice to see you all. God majestic, praise abounds in our God city. We pondered your love in action, God, waiting in your temple. Your name, God, evokes a train of hallelujahs wherever it is spoken, near and far. Your arms are heaped with goodness in action. Be glad, Zion Mountain. Dance, Judah's daughters. God does what he said he'd do. Then you can tell the next generation, detail by t detail, the story of God, our God forever, who guides us until the end of time. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? 
What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to him, them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their disbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any dust, if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed, and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May God bless our understanding of this reading. As we heard in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus did not send the disciples out on their critical and often dangerous mission alone, but in pairs. Now Jesus probably didn't originate it, 
but both Kate and I have experienced a similar buddy system at summer camp. And as you've heard in past sermons, summer camps were pretty significant in both of our upbringings. For me, it was Wavis camps on Damascata Lake in Maine, a camp founded 99 years ago, attended by my mother when she was a child in the 1920s. And then it was the camp that I was sent away to for eight weeks each summer. In the summer, in the past sermons, I've wondered aloud with you all, did my parents really want to get rid of me that much for the entire summer? Was I really that much of a nuisance or a problem? Well, Wavis had both a boys camp and a girls camp. And at each, during swim time in Damascata Lake, they used the buddy system. You know about the buddy check, right? Before you go into the water, you pick or assign a buddy, and then the whistle blows, and you have to grab the hand of your buddy and raise it high so everyone can see you. For safety's sake, you always had to have a buddy. In the brochure from the 1950s, I think, promoting the camp, you find these words. The buddy system not only provides an excellent check on the safety of every individual, but adds the qualities of alertness and responsibility to growing character. Adds the qualities of alertness and responsibility to growing character. In American Christianity, the focus often is on our own personal faith and our own individual relationship with Jesus and with God. That's, of course, okay, but we sometimes forget it's not all about ourselves. And the buddy system reminds us of this. Being a Christian means that we are called to be alert and responsible to the needs of others and not just to our own needs. We are members of the body of Christ. We are members of God's household, God's blessed house, called to work together to share the story of Jesus and to share God's love. Author and theologian Anne Lamott once wrote, a whole lot of us believers of all different religions, of all different faiths are ready to turn back the tide of madness by walking together in both the dark and the light and keeping the faith. The importance of community and walking with one another, supporting one another in both dark and light and in the tide of the world's madness has for many of us come from summer camp experiences. As many of you know, my grandfather started a camp in New York State 50 years ago in hopes that children from New York City could go and play outdoors, swim, ride horses, and experience the joy of God's amazing creation. I love going to my family's camp it is a place of peace and grace and love. In early June, I had the opportunity to go to camp for about the first time in two years. I was there to baptize my cousin Nicole's baby daughter, Maddie. It was a really hot day, but a lovely day with family at a very special place. As we hiked up the mountain to this amazing chapel that was made in memory of my grandpa who died too young, I went past our camp's lake, a place of joy and enthusiasm and companionship. It was then that I thought of the buddy check. 
I thought about it not, because, not only because I was passing that lake at our beloved camp, but because I had married my cousin Nicole and her husband Peter just two years earlier. And in that reflection at their wedding service, I talked about the buddy check and how they would be buddies for each other. And here I was, two years later, almost to the exact day, baptizing their first child, a little one, Maddie, who will grow up knowing the importance of our family camp and of always having a buddy or two or three. For life, in whatever adventure you are currently in, wouldn't it be great to always have a buddy? Well, as you heard in today's reading from the Gospel of Mark, we hear of the importance of sticking together. After the rejection in Jesus' hometown, Jesus purposely sends out his disciples two by two. Maybe he knew something about that old camp buddy system. Two by two, Jesus sends the disciples out down the road on a journey to proclaim good news to the poor, redemption to those who were bound, and justice for the oppressed. Two by two, the disciples travel with one another, told to accept the hospitality and welcome all whom they encounter. Two by two, friends, they are told to dust off their shoes where they are not welcome and continue on the journey. Two by two, not alone, but together, they follow in the way of Christ. And in that amazing reading from Psalm 48, we are reminded of God's presence during a tumultuous time. And we are told that we should always give thanks for God's presence. We could all attest to the fact that many times we feel that presence of God through the words and actions of other people. Brandon Stanton started the Humans of New York blog in November of 2010. Initially, he planned to gather 10,000 portraits of New Yorkers and plot them on a city map. The project soon evolved, however, when Stanton started having conversations with his subjects and then included small quotes and stories alongside his photos. With this new format, the blog began to grow rapidly. Readers felt connected to the people they were learning about and longed for more. One story at a time, the world became a smaller place in New York. Just this year, we read this story. Lee's parents were refugees from Vietnam, and shortly after Lee was born, her mother got hired as a housekeeper. But Lee's mother couldn't bear to leave her with a babysitter, so after only three days, she tried to quit. That's when her employers insisted that Lee bring, uh, that she bring Lee to work instead. Their names were Charles and Kathleen Timlin. And for the next seven years, Lee would grow up in the Timlins' home. They were an elderly couple. They didn't have kids. And Lee was an only child. So they became Lee's playmates. Mr. Timblin had a chair, and so did Mrs. Timblin. Lee would set up a partition in the living room and stage performances for them. They would all go to the park and read books. Lee became an important part of their world. In the evening, they would all eat together, and they would listen to Lee talk incessantly. But they never yelled at Lee or put her in her place. Lee was allowed to play with anything in the house. There was a big rocking chair that Lee used all the time. And for her fourth birthday, they bought a miniature one just for her. 
Eventually, Lee's mom saved enough money to start her own business. And on her last day of work, the Timberlands said to Lee, you are always welcome in our home. Lee would visit them three times a year, his birthday, her birthday, and her own birthday. As a graduation present, they gave Lee a check to help with her college education. Mr. Timblin gave Lee a hug and said, I hope I can dance with you at your wedding. But by then his health had deteriorated and it wasn't long before he passed away. Lee started making an extra effort to visit Mrs. Timblin, but they only had three more years together. Her memorial service was mainly distant family and friends from out of town. Lee flew home from grad school, and all of them were really surprised she had made the trip, especially when Lee explained that her mom used to work for the Timblins. Nobody could understand why they meant so much to Lee. And only then did Lee realize how much the Timblins had made her part of their world. Lee lived in their house for seven years, and not once had she felt like the helper's kid. She always felt at home with them. Friends, look around you at all the companions you have in this blessed house in this family of faith. Look around you and see all the buddies that you have, the people in this beloved community that are there to support you, to care for you, to encourage you, to love you, and to welcome you back to this blessed house. Jesus calls us to go out into the world to share God's love always knowing that we belong to God and to one another. But we not only need buddies to go through this life, through the journey of life, we need a beloved community like First Church because it is a beloved community that reminds us that each and every day we are called by God to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Today is a special day. We are here, gathered, worshiping in live time for the first time in so long. And we give thanks to God for that opportunity. But we know, friends, that each day is a special day when we can wake up and give thanks to God and to remember that we are God's beloved and that we are called to travel out into the world buddy to buddy. Amen. Amen. We are not alone. We live in God's amazing world. We believe in a loving and gracious God. We believe, believe in the importance, importance of being the church. Celebrating God's presence. Embracing life's contradictions. Honoring creation. Sharing our faith stories. Serving others. And working together to share love. We, we are, are not alone. alone. We, we live, live in God's, God's amazing, amazing world. world. Now please join us in singing our closing hymn, Today We All Are Called to Be Disciples.
together in the commissioning. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, to be of good courage, to hold fast to that which is good, to render to no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the afflicted, to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, during these last 16 months, despite being apart, First Church has continued to be the church. But now that we officially are opening up, let us hold on to one of the most important truths of this pandemic, that nothing, nothing in all the world can separate us from God's love, our love for one another, and our love for this beloved community. So let us go hand in hand, buddy to buddy, out into the world, recognizing our responsibility and staying alert to one another's needs and to the world's needs. Buddy check, hands up. Let's go out into the world, sharing God's love with all whom we encounter. Amen. Amen.